Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, and you're going to need to be open-minded today, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a great chat room, so Ravinder, tell us all about it, please. Yes, we do have a great chat room. Actually, we have a a great group of chat roomies, people that come in regularly, uh, offer up their insights, um, entertain us a little bit sometimes, too, but it's always very stimulating conversations so do come in that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat okay now normally we don't take calls because the show is a one hour show it goes by very very rapidly but i'm going to alert you all out there today if something triggers you we're more than happy to take your phone call so this will be a little different show but first in this week's spotlight i wish to draw attention to the nature of some of our psychological mechanisms I often write about the automatic nature of action based on unconscious programs, and indeed, in my book, Gotcha, The Subordination of Free Will, this is fleshed out in such detail that one one reader reported this after reading the book, quote, it seems that almost everything we do is programmed in one way or another and comes from unconscious conditioning, more than rational thought. And whereas a professional, and whereas I am a professional psychologist, I am aware of this. I never before beheld the total picture as you illustrate it in your delightful but sometimes scary book, close quote. That said, one of the factors I failed to discuss in Gotcha has to do with emotion. So please allow me to add that now. Research has shown us that emotion is a critical factor when it comes to thinking. Consider this. Neuroscientist Antonio Damasio worked with a patient he named Elliot. Elliot suffered damage to the central portion of his frontal lobes, an area associated with judgment. Elliot passed several cognitive tests with flying colors. His memory and reasoning abilities were totally intact. However, his life was in ruins. He could not hold a job. It turned out that Elliot had become a perfect stoic. There was absolutely no emotional anything involved where Elliot was concerned. He held his highest achievements and lowest actions with the same regard, no differentiation whatsoever. Given this, Eliot was unable to prioritize. Think about that for a moment. It is emotion that adds to our reasoning ability the nature of priorities. Do we continue to wash our dishes while a house burns down around us, or do we seek refuge from the fire? It is emotion that instructs us. Emotion informs us we must go to work or lose our job. Emotion is the prime mover, to steal a phrase from Aristotle, and without it we are unable to use our reason in anything but some abstract manner. So sure, we can consider the ramifications of our actions, but so what? What difference does any of it mean without some emotional component? We find, however that too much emotion and or, if you will, distorted emotion gets in our rational way. For example, research clearly shows that if we are stressed, our decision process is severely hampered, as is our ability to solve simple problems. It's like the maize bright rat who, when food is withheld to the point of acute hunger, could no longer run the the maze despite the fact that the rat has run this same maze easily hundreds of times. So what is the balance between rationality and balanced emotion? Think of it this way. We are in an election year. When you mention a candidate, what do you feel? You may love one and hate the other. The minute someone says, for example, they're going to vote for Trump, how do you respond? Or in the alternative, when someone says they're voting for Clinton, 
we can often find that our emotion is so strong in favor or against a candidate that we're no longer capable of true ratiocination. Our emotion distorts our thinking because it is not balanced. The next time you find yourself considering options, try to do so without allowing your emotions to dominate your decision. Make an internal adjustment and allow yourself the opportunity to consider all possibilities as though you were unaware of anything but the decision process. Then consider the impact of your decision on your life path, desires, principles, etc., as free of prejudgment as possible. Only this way can your emotion guide your rational process by properly establishing priorities. Sound bites are not priorities unless you accept them. Reason is, reason is something you come to privately, not as a matter of group think. My thoughts anyway for what it might be worth. Your thoughts on this one, Ravinder? I think that's all really interesting. I mean, you're once again saying we need to take some time to think about what it is we're thinking about and don't just accept ideas out there and think about the why questions. You have that in gotcha, wasn't there, that research that was done where if uh, you had to ask yourself three, if you had to answer three why questions for your decision, then it tended to make you more moderate anyway. So that would directly speak to what you were just saying, especially this election year when, you know, Emotions they're both so high. extreme. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy one. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Richard Rowland, and we spoke about hopes in his new book, Unspoken Messages. Larry wrote, I am convinced after listening to you and Richard that horses probably all animals must have souls. Loretta commented, this show was truly inspiring. I loved it. Pinji wrote, when I see flower buds, I see hope. I like that. Tammy wrote, I really enjoyed your show Thursday. The show confirmed my thoughts on healing experiences with past choices regarding the fear of death and fear itself. When fear is removed out of any situation or thought, it strengthens healing. I recently also am going through naturopathic, looking at Qigong and Reiki, reading positive great books, and I love all your books and have some of your CDs. I found working with my herbs and diet and a positive flow daily of good information that I have more clarity. I just want to thank you for all you do and your great inspirational and informative speakers. Mary Beth wrote, Richard D. Rowland, thank you for sharing your powerful message and making a difference in our world. I have a copy of her book, and I thank you. Great interview with Eldon Taylor. <laughs> Iona wrote, I love to hear anything Eldon Taylor talks about. I have learned so much about myself and how I think and how my brain works. Well, thanks, Iona. Dr. Paul wrote, I have been using your recordings for healing with my clients, and they work great. Right now, we have lots of fear going on in the world, and that translates into lots of disease, especially kidney disease. Thank you for your life's work. Mark wrote, I find your approach excellent. However, I think that mind over genes is more accurate. We have genes, and so our influence is within that framework. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that we have the ability to turn them on and off, even during pregnancy. I personally still have to fight that fight in my own mind about mind over genes in terms of turning things off. However, the other side of that is still healthy lifestyle, Good eating habits, which, of course, is all driven by our mind, motivation, attitude. I appreciate your Intertalk CDs and think they are a great tool to help overcome all sorts of things. The problem is getting people to actually use them. <laughs> you have a point, Mark, and I'm reminded of the old proverb. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. How many times have you heard from somebody who got a CD and they, you know, they didn't play it as was instructed, you know, every day, once a day for 30 days, you know. Instead, they played it once or twice, and then they call you on the phone and say, you know, I've had this CD for a month, I played it twice, and somehow I just don't feel like anything's happening. I know, we did get some interesting responses, but then again, we get some fabulous responses with different customers, too. Well, so. Of course, I mean, yeah, but I mean, Absolutely yeah. Absolutely incredible. All right, yeah, the key is, nothing works if you don't use it. That's true, okay. absolutely. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon at eldentaylor.com 
or by joining me on Facebook. And I want to thank all of you again for your letters and comments. We truly do appreciate you. Now to this week's show. Modern Day Liberalism, Exploring the Psychological Foundations of Disorder with author J.D. Mitchke. I'll tell you right up front, this show promises to be a bit controversial, to say the least. For the book we're discussing today, Modern Day Liberalism, proposes that not only do people have their heads in the sand with regard to the real world, but liberalism has gone so far as to be considered a disorder due classification in the diagnostic manual. Indeed, today's guest views modern liberalism as, and I quote, a distorted emotionality that brings about disastrous results, close quote. But with a caveat, we'll have him define what he means by modern day liberalism. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. J.D. Mitchke has an extensive educational background in the psychological sciences, holding a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in psychological counseling, a bachelor's degree in metaphysical science, trained and certified as a practitioner of hypnosis and a member of the National Board of Certified Clinical Hypnotherapists. J.D. currently offers workshops and presentations to groups under the title of The Primary Human Emotions and the Structure of the Personality. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. J.D. Mitchke. Eldon, thank you so much. It's It's indeed a pleasure to have you. I, I have to tell you, I enjoyed your book, but boy, do you ever run the edge with this one. So you heard today's spotlight, and your book is more than a little controversial, so tell us, have you lost friends or been called stupid and the like by others over your work due to emotional bias rather than cool-headed, rational thinking? I mean, the title itself is a bit inflammatory, isn't it? Well, it, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure I've lost some friends, uh, but um, uh, it's controversial, uh, nonetheless. Yeah, certainly it is. Um, but um, anyway, I, you know, I've noticed that there is a great deal of synchronicity in the air. Um, and, of course, you know what that is. Carl Jung talked about synchronicity, which is uh, a various number of events of the same nature, sort of converging at the same time. And so just this past week, I've heard at least three times on the news media that uh, people need to get their head out of the sand. And um, I believe that Ben Carson uh, actually said these words, so that that took me by surprise because I don't hear people say this. <clears throat> and so I thought, well, maybe they have a copy of my book or, you know, what's what's going on here? But, uh, well, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're a healthcare professional, so you knew you would alienate many when you wrote your book. Why, why write it and risk soiling your brand? Well, um, it's, it's a matter of uh, stating facts, Eldon. You know, there's an old adage uh, that maybe people have heard from their grandmother, their wise old grandmother, and the grandmother said, hey, if you can't say something nice about somebody... Don't say anything at all. Mm-hmm. Well, in this case, if I can't say something nice about something, someone, the least I can do is state facts. So that's that's sort of where I'm where I'm coming from. But uh, I've I've always been somewhat of the scientist when it comes to studying human behavior, and so uh, I've always looked for facts. And so I'm going to present the facts uh, and let the facts take us wherever they go. Now, uh, a lot of people may not like the facts, but uh, they will have to deal with that. That's not my responsibility. Okay, well, and 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 that's why you earned a way onto this show is exactly that kind of attitude where, okay, we're going to look at some facts. But before we do, I think what we need to do is examine your proposition that liberalism is a psychological disorder. And to do that, we need to define both liberalism in the way you're using the word and psychological disorder. So begin. Please well, define liberalism first. What do you mean by this? And are you addressing the Democratic Party when you say it? Or is this just is this a broader piece of paint than that? Well, let's take liberalism. Now, if someone looks at the classic defi- definition of liberalism, 
I mean, just to break down the word, we have the word liberty. Now, that all sounds good and well. You know, liberty, equality, fraternity, and all that good stuff, I mean, that's all fine and well. But somewhere along the line, <clears throat> liberty has become distorted and uh, abused uh, to the extent that um, dispensing liberty has become the role of the, the, the government and uh, authoritarian governments. And so, uh, and so they are the ones who, uh, it appears to me, choose to dispense what liberty is. And unfortunately, oftentimes this goes contrary to, to, to really good sense and logic and so forth. Okay. Uh, I now, guess I, I, I want to I pursue this a little bit, make sure that I'm clear. I had a conversation earlier today with uh, Ravinder, and we were talking about a book that she's reading. It's called Three Swans. And uh, w one of the characters in this book, a Chinese woman, is talking about her life. And uh, her life, for all intent and purposes at that point, is under Mao Zedong and uh, the revolution of the peasants and... Uh, and, of course, the entire idea there, and she accepts communism, is that what we want to do is, this is a peasant revolution. We want to see that everybody has the same thing. We want to share, share alike at all levels. And any student of political science knows that, you know, during Mao's reign, uh, his military personnel wore the same uniform. There was no indication of rank on those uniforms. Uh, as a case in point. So th this was uh, an era of uh, of uniformity, if you will, share and share alike again, okay? Now, that was the idea, and, and of course she was attracted to that idea because she was coming out of being a peasant, not having anything. And, uh, you know, it, 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 as we discuss this, Ravinder indicated to me that she thought all these rules that they had in place about you know, how they behaved at that time were perhaps, you know, improper. I mean, why would you have those rules? And I suggested to her that protocols are really important. I remember when the protocol uh, to address someone as Mr. or Mrs. or Dr. broke down and we got, you know, everything is on a first name basis. And of course, as soon as you go to a first name basis, well, then everything is equal. And as these protocols begin to break down so does the principle of respect and then that infiltrates at even further levels so if i'm understanding you correctly you're basically saying liberty in your definition it does not include any kind of a notion about disrespect or uh, share and share alike or we're all entitled to um, but it's been perverted to mean that. Is that did I get that right or not, JD? Well, <clears throat> there there is in our culture I I perceive the sense of entitlement. Um, a sense of entitlement uh, and I think people have not earned it. Um, but yet they be they believe they're entitled to it. Um so I'm I'm not quite sure what you know where you're going with that, Eldon. Uh, well, that's okay. Maybe I led you astray. I just okay. So you're saying, and, and just to distill that, that liberalism is a sense of entitlement. It has nothing to do with the idea of liberty. Liberalism, in your definition, then, is the idea that well, because I'm here, I, this is due to me, as opposed to well, I'm due you know, what, the right of freedom, the liberty to pursue happiness. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, may I take the, the conversation this way? and Yeah, take uh, it any way you want, and, J.D. And Flesh it out. And, and let's talk about, let's talk about the, the roots of uh, decision-making. And um, it, is, <clears throat> it is my thesis in the book that it, it is emotion that drives every single human behavior. And um, just taking from the bullet points on my book, decisions and actions based upon distorted emotion can only bring disastrous results. And continuing, <clears throat> uh, humanity is out of sync in regard to natural rhythmic emotional behavior. How and so? so? 
And so uh, these emotional disharmonies that we see manifest uh, from the liberal point of view are a result of these disharmonies. And so my, my thesis is to bring people back to rhythmic functioning uh, emotionally uh, so that they can make full use of reason, logic, and common sense. Okay, but I'm going to have to ask you to unpack that. What do you, I mean, what do you mean by you want to bring them back to rhythmic? How are they out of rhythmic, natural rhythmic order now? Well, if one takes uh, some various decisions that come down the pike at us, uh, you know, from our government hierarchy at, at whatever level, uh, oftentimes they're based upon an emotional perception of something. They're driven by emotion, and when <clears throat> and when these uh, and the, when these notions are dissected and and looked at, I mean, there is really there is really no good no good sense uh, to these decisions. Okay, but um, I mean, I, I kind of get that. But let, let's say, look, uh, the argument of my, you know, you're gonna you're, you're gonna take food out of my grandmother's mouth, kind of argument that is attached to welfare, or uh, you know, we're gonna cut back Social Security, and you know, your grandmother can starve. Kind of, those kinds of uh, arguments, they're they're emotional, but but Social Security is also a necessary. You know, net, is it not? I mean, these people did well, pay into it, and is it I'm, welfare also that? So now, emotion no, does have a place, doesn't it? Well, nowhere do I have to take taking Social Security out of the mouths of uh, the old people. Uh, that that I don't do. No, 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 um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you do, but emotion is what drives the politicians to put these arguments on the plate that then later come down out of Congress or out of the administration is the rules you're talking about, aren't it? Isn't it? Well, they're, you know, they're, we have to look at their motivation, and generally their motivation is looking for a vote. And what they want to do actually is uh, create fear in the masses and instill fear uh, to, uh, to get the vote of the people. And, of course, if the people succumb to it, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to vote for these same politicians. All right, well, do this for me, J.D. Give me an example. Can you give me a concrete example of what you're talking about? One of these things that comes down out of uh, uh, Washington that uh, violates just common sense, rational well, thinking. Yeah. Um, let me, um, I'll, I'll draw from my very root, Eldon. Uh, okay. Now, uh, my roots are in Texas. I grew up in Texas. Uh -huh. And I, I grew up in a small town in West Texas. And um, and actually, your listenership can Google it. It's Herald, Texas. Now, what came down the pike recently, of course, our president mandated that uh, public school restrooms should be open to transsexuals. Okay, now, 0.3% Transgenders, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 0.3% of the population are transsexual. And then if you, if you were able to determine what part of those people really really care what restroom they, they, they go to, I mean, that's an unknown factor. And so you have this massive uh, decision coming down from above, this authoritative decision uh, coming down to the masses, and we have to bow to this. We have to succumb to it. And furthermore, there's, there's blackmail attached to it because if you don't do it, then your funds will be cut. And so, um, I mean, it's just, uh, it's insanity. I mean, okay, so the Pentagon today, the Pentagon just today, uh, ruled that uh, they're no longer banning tra transgenders from the military. And you would argue, if I've got you correctly, that that's an emotionally driven decision, uh, not based on a factual analysis of any kind whatsoever, but rather on some idea of empathy that is due to this class of people. Have well, I got that driven, right? It's driven by political correctness. And the, the foundation of political correctness is fear and guilt. And so it, it, political correctness is so ubiquitous, and, and people allow themselves to succumb to it that... Um, that, that then people are fearful to uh, c to counter it and go against it. 
and so we and so we continue to see these things happening uh, across our culture, uh, an, an issue getting getting rammed down our throats, um, driven by a very very small portion of the population, and again this uh, this ubiquitous cloud that hangs over everybody of fear and guilt, and so that's what drives it. You know, in the military, if, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they should have rules and regs, which they do, and standards. Uh, you know, an e- easy solution is all they need to do is stick to their standards. I, mean, I need to hold you up there, J.D., because we have a, a hard break coming up. I don't want the computer to kick us out. But let me, let me when we come back, I'm going to ask you to contrast liberalism with the perspective of uh, the pro- the progressive view. So we can kind of see, I mean, see how this all fleshes out, okay? We're speaking with J.D. Mitchke about his life and book, Modern Day Liberalism. To learn more about J.D. and his work, visit his website at citizenawaken.com. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Do you feel like you've become lost in the funhouse, only seeing the reflection of yourself, past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you? I invite you to step through the doorway and onto a pathway leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Eldon Taylor's New York Times bestselling book, Choices and Illusions. Now expanded, updated, and revised, it will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free of your current perceptions and begin your journey to How High Is Up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with J.D. Mitchke about his life and book, Modern Day Liberalism. To learn more about J.D. and his work, visit his website at citizenawake.com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music. Music psychology is a new hobby of mine. It's a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including investigations of intelligence, personality, social behavior, and we often get a fair amount of self-disclosure from our guests by the music they choose. With that said, all right, we just played some of Lionel Richie, Love Will Find a Way, so please tell us, J.D., how does this one instruct us about who you are? Hi, Elder. Nice to be back. Hmm. Well, let's go back to 1983, and... um, uh, prior to this time, I had an interest in uh, paleontology. And okay. so I'm making a cross-country trip, and I stop into the Petrified Forest in Arizona. And many of you may have been there. And so uh, this is in April. They had just had some nice, cool showers, and the, the conical shapes of the terrain, the old, ancient, petrified clays were of all of these magnificent colors, the purples, magentas, and so on and so forth. Right. And so uh, anyone who's been there will know that the trail is actually a 17-mile uh, road that traverses through the park. I had to be the only person there. And so, uh, and so this April day, I had a, sort of an epiphany uh, that uh, I realized, and, and it was like a... Uh, a notion, a vision that came to me, and I understood exactly about the demise of the dinosaurs. I understood what happened. Now, it so happens that concurrent with that, this particular song was uh, on the charts. And for some reason, uh, anytime I think about this by association, I think of this song. You like now, it. <clears throat> now, there's also a connection uh, with that in my book. And by the way, it's really hard for me to come up with, with favorite things. I mean, my wife always says, 
to me, well, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? I don't have favorite stuff. It's just it's too difficult to come up with favorite things. But uh, in any event, <clears throat> what the, the connection I want to make with my book is that uh, I talk about the five primary human emotions in modern-day liberalism, mm -hmm. and that is the heart and soul of this book. Um, and I explain them fully. And so one thing I learned is that uh, about the human emotions is that until all the emotions are working in harmony and rhythm, one will be inhibited from realizing their true love potential. And once they realize their love potential, then all kinds of doors are open to one. And I think this song by Lionel Rich Richie uh, portrays uh, this very thing, this very notion. And um, so, anyway, that's the connection <clears throat> between my song and uh, and uh, gotcha. the petrified forest and such. Gotcha. All right, you brought it up. So, do you want to flesh out those five emotions? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, each one of us, uh, we have an emotional component. Now, it's important also to say that um, this, this structure of the human being, and we are very complicated. Um, I launched into a study of the human being decades ago. I was absorbed with a passion to really understand uh, this marvelous piece of machine, machinery called the human being and how we function. Now, Part and parcel of of this human being, we have four components, based, basically. We have the physical component, we have the intellectual component, the emotional component, and the spiritual component, or intuitive. Uh, and so all of these components uh, sh are, are designed to work in harmony and rhythm together. Now, why is the emotional component so important? Well, it is because, as I alluded to earlier, everything we do, every action that we take is driven by emotion. Everything we do. Um, <clears throat> were that not the case, then, you know, we'd, we'd sort of be like the coneheads from the old Saturday Night Live show. Everything was monosyllabic, and they, there was no voice inflection and, and none of that. And so... <clears throat> right, that was the have, point of today's spotlight. Right, right. Uh, and so we only have five emotions. We, we only have five. And these very emotions begin to function as early as six months of age. And uh, they're set in motion, and they are working. Uh, and I'll name those emotions. Let's start with uh, fear. Okay, fear is an emotion that essentially uh, guarantees our survival and self-preservation. Uh, we are only born with two fears. Uh, one is the fear of falling, and two is the fear of loud noises. Now, think about that. Um, all other fears we have, we learn. And so we are, we are a culture that is really permeated with so many fears. I mean, all we need to do is, is examine and look around and, and see how many of us are uh, on medications to alleviate all of these various fears. And so it is, it is not our natural state to have all of these fears. And then furthermore, when fear is used as a tool to manipulate and control us, it just compounds the problems. Okay, so that's the emotion of fear. Next emotion, grief. Okay, grief is the emotion that we experience upon loss. Could be the loss of a loved one. Could be the loss of a job. Could be the loss of vocation. It could be a number of things. And then the next fear we have is anger. Anger is the emotion that serves to move us against obstacles and to take on challenges. Uh, that is the emotion of fear. The next emotion is the emotion of jealousy. Now, a lot of people have a problem with this name because they confuse it with what is normally associated with jealousy. Jealous lovers, jealous that that one owns this or that, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not the case. If you break the word down, uh, you derive the word zeal. And zeal, further, you can break it down to uh, passion, ardor, uh, fervor, etc. It's the emotion that pushes us and drives us to reach a goal. That's the emotion of jealousy. 
And, of course, the emotion of love uh, is the fifth. Uh, the emotion of love, some consider the highest of the emotions, but it's, it stands alone in the respect that uh, there is generally not a, uh, a balanced cause and effect between the giving of love. In other words, uh, when we get angry, we express angry uh, in proportion to the circumstance, and then the emotion is spent. Same with, with grief and, uh, and so forth. Same with fear. But with the emotion of love, it is boundless uh, in, in, in its expression. And so, uh, and so I want to say also that all of the primary emotions are positive. There is no such thing as a negative emotion. They're all positive. Emotions become negative when they're allowed to uh, uh, congeal, when they're repressed. Uh, many people have a belief that some of the emotions are verboten, they're taboo, uh, whether it's grief, whether it's anger. I think in our culture we have a totally, totally wrong-headed, distorted view of anger. Uh, it's looked at as a bad thing, and that's not the case. And so what happens then, uh, people begin to repress anger. And this marvelous piece of machinery, the human being, is so designed that if there's an imbalance, if something needs to give uh, to adjust it, uh, nature will find a way. Uh, that emotion will somehow get expressed. It's like when we're hungry, we eat. When, when we're tired, we sleep. When we have an infection, the body uh, sends reinforcements to fight it, whether it's a bacterial, if it's viral, whatever. The body is always looking to achieve balance uh, within itself, and, it, and it's the same condition with the emotions. If the emotions become repressed, uh, then uh, unconsciously or so forth, the body will find a way to express it. Why else would... Uh, we see these people out uh, in a protest rally. They're carrying signs. They're <clears throat> they're shouting their their venomous slogans and so on and so forth. Well, they're actually expressing emotion, but um, unfortunately, oftentimes uh, it's way out of proportion. Uh, they don't get to the real bottom, the cause of their emotions, and rather than achieving something positive, all they do is destroy and hurt and kill okay so but isn't that isn't that as true uh jd i don't want to interrupt you but isn't that as true of both sides of the aisle well yes it is i in modern day liberalism i make it very clear that the condition of liberalism is uh is not partisan uh it goes to both sides of, of the, the 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 aisle so to speak um liberalism is a degree, <clears throat> and um, and let me just say, say also, Eldon, that when when I talk about liberalism, I really don't like to get into the classic definitions of of liberal and all that. Uh, what I really like to use as a backdrop is the in the political governmental arena, we think of liberal and conservative, and I think most everybody uh, in in the society would agree that, yes, indeed, there is this, uh, these camps of liberal or conservative. But um, I make it very clear in, in modern-day liberalism that uh, liberalism is an equal opportunity intruder. And, and it all depends on the individual. Uh, what, what is going on with that individual? Do they have their, uh, their house in order? And, uh, and so it's always a matter of degree. Okay, now, J.D., you break down uh, or you suggest uh, that this actually belongs in a diagnostic manual because it, for all intent and purposes, is a psychological disorder. Can you give us an example of what you mean by how these emotions, um, the way you've described them, used within modern-day liberalism, within your context... Um, lend themselves to being a psychological disorder? Well, uh, <laughs> going into the arena of a psychological disorder, um, I also make it clear that um, 
there is no real defi- definition of a uh, mental illness. I mean, it's uh, it's a variable. I mean, there just is not a definition. Um, but um, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but let's look at our elected officials. Uh, and I would say that they are driven in great part by fear. Okay? They, they are in their positions of authority, and um, we wouldn't think of them as being fearful people, but they really are. And that goes all the way to the top, to, uh, to the president, Barack Hussein Obama. They are fearful, angry people. And uh, and then to I mean to to really get into the detail of how they got there I mean that deserves some uh, close look and scrutiny uh, at the individual I mean everyone everyone is is unique in the respect of of all the conditioning factors that that go to make them who and what they are and so uh, it's it's a matter of uh, looking at each individual to determine that. So are you saying that our elected officials, um, both sides of the aisle, uh, operate out of fear more than any other emotion? Well, I, uh, I mean, these are general statements, and, uh, but yes, I mean, they're very fearful. Uh, I, when, when we look at the exchanges uh, in the, within the Republican Party, the attitudes against Donald Trump, let's say, for example, um, they... Uh, they shift. I mean, one one Republican one week will say one thing, and then the next week uh, he'll change position. And so <clears throat> they're all motivated by uh, part of that motivation is fear. I had a politician once tell me, "Our first duty once we're elected is to get reelected. It isn't to do anything else." That's right. So are you equating the fear when we see? You know these what decision changes, these swing, uh, wild swings of support one day and no support the next day, and support the following day. Are you saying that that's they're monitoring the polls, they're paying attention to their reelectability, and that's the root of their fear? Both, <clears throat> both of those things: the polls, their reelectability. Uh, it could be their monetary gain. Um, a lot of things come into play. And so then uh, the, the citizen across America, what you have to ask is whether or not these people are really serving your purposes. And the answer is no. Of course they're not. They're serving their own purposes. Okay. It, your book covers so much. This could be a four- or five-hour program, but I'm glad you made it clear that liberalism can infect both sides of the aisle. However, there are some principles that you assert in your book that would seem to be rather uh, conservative. One of those is the idea that, quote, some issues deserve a steadfast position, close quote. Okay. Do you therefore believe that values are not relative, or do you subscribe to the idea of cultural relativism? Uh, no, I do not subscribe to uh, cultural relativism. Uh, there, there are some things that I believe are perennial, they are, are enduring, they are universal, and they are steadfast. Um, <clears throat> for example, when it comes to the, this issue, it, this issue has never been so much on the forefront of people confused about their sexuality. Well, come on now. I mean, there, there have to be some standards uh, of some sort by which people can figure these things out. But um, we, we see cultural relativity. Uh, you know, for example, two years ago, uh, Barack Hussein Obama and Colin Powell, or maybe it was in 2014, uh, 2012, they suddenly did an about face on homosexual marriage, okay? So, right. uh, so it's this relativism uh, that, that thrives uh, in, in our culture. And it uh, truly, it goes contrary to anything universal and steadfast and enduring. Uh, so, but that tends to pin you more towards, if we follow labels, that would pin you more uh, definitely towards the conservative side. And, and, and so let me ask you something else, because your writing, in a sense, reminded me of Ayn Rand. 
and she discusses the nature of self and the importance of holding self as a special part of creation, honoring it, not dishonoring it by sublimating self in the name of the so-called greater good. What's your take on the more liberal notion of share and share alike, or the Marxist idea from each according to his ability to each according to his needs? Well, <clears throat> I uh, I have another set of tenets and principles which were delivered to me decades ago uh, by teachers of mine, and um, and I adhere to those principles, and one of which is this. All true benefits must be earned, and all true benefits must be mutual. And so um, let me start by saying that it behooves every person <clears throat> on this, in this society to earn their place in this society. Um, and I don't think anyone would disagree with me that there are many people uh, in our society who do not earn their place. And so uh, they don't contribute. And so everybody needs to be a contributor to our society. Um, otherwise, um, it becomes a process of taking from those who have and giving to those who don't have. And it's not that people should not share. If you look at any culture on this earth where you have more generous people, it's, it's here in the, U in the United States. I mean, we have more generous people <clears throat> that it's astounding. I mean, for decades, we have been the nation of givers. We always look out for those less fortunate. That's just in our nature. Um, it's just who we are. But then um, that, that has been taken advantage of to a great, great degree. And, and I think uh, on, in, in regard to our leadership, it has taken advantage of in the respect of trying to win the support of those they are claiming to uh, to support uh, the, the so-called uh, underprivileged or whoever they, they might be. So is that why, if I understood your book correctly, you were offended by Nancy Pelosi's, uh, you know, coaching, if you will, uh, while you're unemployed, go home, you know, start your own business, plant a garden, relax, take a year off. Well, yeah, she says sit on your sofa and uh, I, I suppose imaz imagine what you want to do. Well, <clears throat> you know, why not take action? I mean, people need to take action, make a decision, and then get motivated, engage their emotion. The emotion Not just stay behavior. home and collect unemployment, huh? I'm sorry? And not just stay home and collect unemployment? Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. Use the secret and imagine and fantasize and do boards, storyboards and whatnot about where you're going to be if you don't move off that sofa? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't quite <laughs> no, catch that. It's all right, J.D. We joke about that all the time. There's a book called The Secret, and it basically oh, yeah. okay. tells you you can, you can visualize these things into reality. You don't have to do a thing, you know? Well, that, uh, look, that's just, um, uh, that's just nonsense. Yeah, you no know, kidding. I mean, there's a, there's a place for visualization and to engage the imagination, but there's also a place uh, to uh, engage the thinking. You know, it calls for the right and left brain, basically. You have to engage both. And then, We're about out of time, sir, and I want everybody to know how they can learn more about you, where they can get your book, uh, courses that you may be offering, and so forth. So please tell us that. Share that with our audience. Uh, yes, please go to my website. The website is Citizen Awaken. That's singular, C-I-T-I-Z-E-N-A-W-A-K-E-N.com. Uh, be patient. It's a website in the works, in the making, so it's going to grow as time goes on. But you can contact me. There's a, sh there's a page. Uh, you can contact me by email. Let me know your your wishes, desires, if you um, are interested in a workshop. I like small workshops. Uh, we delve into the primary human emotions, and um, I talk about a lot of other topics as well. I talk about uh, uh, dreams. I talk about uh, healing, and uh, I broach a number of other topics. All right. So, We're out of time. 
J.D., I want to thank you for your work and for your willingness to share it with us. And uh, maybe we'll have you back again, huh? Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.